Thank you for coming to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this series of shows on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable, is being filmed in my gardens in Norfolk. Right now I'm in the herb garden, and this rose has just almost finished blooming, and this is an old-fashioned rose. It's called Rose Officinalis, which is just kind of a very old, generic rose. And it's very fragrant. The petals are extremely fragrant. And it is used, was used in the uh, apothecary trade for perfumes and other cosmetic uses. Uh, probably no longer used in that way, but it adds a lot of fragrance and beauty to the garden when it's in full bloom. This is a once blooming rose. And normally with uh, the blooms, roses that bloom repeatedly, we would be deadheading this rose. But this one I will just leave and let it form rose hips. Also, I can prune this rose after it's finished blooming. Uh, if I had pruned it before it bloomed, I would have pruned off all the blooms. So we don't want to prune the once blooming roses until after they have bloomed. And this one's almost finished. You can see a few new roses. Uh, it's multi-petaled, but not a double. In the back I have valerian. This is also an herb. I think it was once used, it has been used uh, medicinally. I don't use it that way. I believe it's the roots that are used as a sedative, but uh, it has wonderfully fragrant blossoms that smell a bit like cherry pie. So I like it for its flowers, and because it is an herb, I do keep it in the herb garden. The culinary herbs in this garden are all ready to use right now, and uh, I will be picking these and using them in the kitchen for the rest of the summer. It's so nice to have fresh herbs again. I have uh, savory, uh, nepotella, which is an Italian herb, rosemary, fennel. Uh, over here we have lots of different thymes. Another rosemary in a pot, this time, which uh, I will keep watered. Most of the time I don't water the things in the herb garden unless it's extremely dry, but the ones in the pots will need a little water from the watering can as the season progresses. Then I have the lemon herbs, lemon and lime, lemon and lime thyme, and lemon and lime uh, balm. And these, again, can be used now. They're getting ready to flower, so now is the time if you want to dry them, you do pick them right before they flower. I've harvested some of the rose petals to dry from this rose and several others that are very fragrant. And so I would have some dried rose petals in the house. Every once in a while I run into a recipe, particularly for cookies or a cake, that calls for dried rose petals. So I do dry a few and keep them in my kitchen. Sage is doing well. And mint. We've had a wet and warm couple of weeks and mint loves that. So I have lots of orange mint, chocolate mint, apple mint, all different kinds of mint that I can add to my tea, add to lemonade, uh, use in some of the Middle Eastern dishes, call for mint, and it's right here to use, and nice to have something fresh. You can buy mint at the grocery store, you can buy any of these at the grocery store, but there's really a difference if you have them fresh from the garden. Oregano, and tarragon are also here, as is the sage, and these can all be picked for drying. Sage will stay pretty nicely right through fall, so you can uh, harvest that fresh probably right through November. There's not much going on here except watching for uh, anything that dries out extremely. Herbs are not much bothered by pests. We do have a few butterflies that wing their way in occasionally, and some bees when the things are in bloom. But as far as other pests go, you don't really have to worry about it too much with the herbs. This is another rose, Rosa Monday, which I thought was dead. I just left it alone, and uh, lo and behold, it's coming back nicely. That one I will watch, and probably water. Other things that might need watering in your herb garden would be things that you've put in more recently. If you add something now or even 
within the last couple weeks. You need to watch it if we get a dry spell and water it. So far we haven't had any dry spells. We've had plenty of rain. And now with the warmer weather, if we continue to get the rain, things will continue to grow and be very lush. Now let's head on over to the perennial garden and see what's in bloom. I have some yarrow about ready to come into bloom and a fo lone foxglove up here at this corner. I'll let this one go to seed and spread the seeds around so that we will have more foxgloves next year. Lilies are starting to bloom and these are the Asiatic lilies. They're the first ones to bloom and they're followed by, in a couple weeks, the oriental lilies. And I have a few of those in this area as well. But the Asiatics are the earliest ones. If you pick some to bring in the house, make sure that you uh, snip off the little black parts from the center. They stain clothing badly. If you do happen to stain your clothing with lilies, uh, most florists cut them off if you get lilies from a florist. But uh, if you get some that aren't cut off, be sure to cut them off. Otherwise, they'll stain your tablecloth if you have a table arrangement or any clothing that you have. I had a shirt a few years ago that I brushed up against the lily plant and got this huge orange stain on it. Washed it with several different preparations and they didn't come out. And then I read that you could put it out in the sun. And that's the magic. If you get the lily stain on any clothing or a tablecloth, just set it out in a bright, on a bright sunny day and the stain will disappear, even after you've washed it. It's kind of a miracle. I have a delphinium and we have plenty of bulb foliage. Remember, we need to let it cure naturally. Well, it has. And now we have just a lot of brown. If it pulls out very easily, it's time to get it out of the garden. And if you have large spaces, you can either add planters of plants when it's gone, or you can add some annuals from the uh, garden center, or ones you've grown yourself and prepared to put into the locations that are vacated by the bulbs. Or you can just mulch them and leave them empty. It's time to deadhead certain things that have already gone by. And uh, some of the salvia has uh, started, and that can be deadheaded back a bit. And the thing with salvia, if you look closely, you'll see that new buds are forming for new blooms. So when you deadhead it, don't go back too far. And it will come back into bloom. Once these, all the purple is gone from this plant, I will cut everything back and before long we'll have new blooms. But you need to be careful when you deadhead things to get it at the right spot because some things will rebloom. Day lilies will be on soon. Day lilies and the uh, oriental lilies are completely different plants. Day lilies have a root system underneath and these have a bulb underneath. The bulbs are planted in the fall. So if you see lilies you like at somebody's house, uh, check your catalogs, uh, bulb catalogs, go online, and you will find bulbs that you can order now to plant in October, and you too will have lilies next year. I have a variety of both the Asiatic and the Oriental. The Orientals are in bud now, and will be out in a few weeks, about the time these are gone. This is a Campanula, and uh, it's Campanula Elizabeth, since that's my name, I couldn't resist it. However, it does spread. I have to be very careful to take out any seedlings that spread all over the place, so it's one to be careful with. It could take over your whole garden if you let it, and I'm trying not to let it. The Flomus is in bloom. I think we looked at this uh, a couple weeks ago. It was coming into bloom. It's almost finished. It's a funny plant. It has uh, layers of bloom, which makes it a very interesting plant to add to the garden. Most plants are either bushy or have their blooms all on top, but uh, this one happens to have them in layers, so I find it to be a pretty interesting plant. My garden is full, and that's on purpose. The more flowers you have, the less room there is for weeds, and I rather like that. Like everybody else, weeding is not my favorite chore, but it is one that is necessary. I try to get out early in the morning and go through my gardens and do some weeding. 
This week it will be removing bulb foliage uh, throughout the garden so that things can bloom. I've cut back the goldenrod, and yes, I do have goldenrod in the garden. That will bloom in the fall. And I cut it back by about half so that it would form new sprouts, and it's doing that right now. You can see uh, some new spots coming, so we'll have more blooms. It will also be a little bit shorter. Here's one I can cut back now. And again, it will make shorter blooms. This is a verbasicum, and it's ready to be cut back. And sometimes this too will give a secondary bloom. So I just go around with my clippers and clip things off when they're finished. These I'm letting dry a little longer, then I'll clip these and save them. The alium, it finished blooming several weeks ago, but uh, I'll clip them off and save them for decorations. They look nice mixed in with Christmas greens, especially if they're sprayed white or gold. The poppies are finished, and I have a daisy, one daisy back here that's just getting going. But the poppies, again, I too will leave these to dry. I think this is a better angle. And uh, then I'll cut them down. The poppy foliage itself, you can see it's starting to turn brown. It will completely disappear in another month, only to come up in the fall. Don't worry, it's not dead. That's its normal life cycle. It will die down after it blooms, and then come up with a flush of foliage in the fall. These are coral bells. Many of the coral bells these days are grown solely for the foliage, and a lot of them are very shade tolerant. These are in full sun, and they are ones, more an old style coral bell, that's grown for its little coral bells that adorn the top of the plant. When these go by, again, I'll cut them back and they'll just keep coming. Not as great a profusion, but they will keep coming throughout the summer. They're kind of an airy plant. This is butterfly weed and it's just starting to bloom. A favorite of the monarch butterfly, it is in the milkweed family. It's not as aggressive as milkweed, which again can spread throughout your whole garden, but it does uh, draw the butterflies and it is a host plant for their caterpillars. So if I notice uh, chewed leaves, I will be happy that perhaps a monarch caterpillar has been there. This is a knockout rose. And as such, it is blooming and has been blooming. And I will deadhead that back. Each cluster will get deadheaded back to a leaf with either three or five petals or leaves, and it will continue blooming. By deadheading it, you uh, encourage its bloom. Now this one doesn't look so well, so I'll just cut the whole thing off. Keeping the roses deadheaded, and once this rose has finished its first flush, which is very soon, probably this weekend, it will need to be fertilized. Roses do best if they're fertilized three times a year. Once in April, again in July, April or early May. Uh, this year it was early May because we had kind of a late start to spring. And uh, then again with a half dose of fertilizer in August. You don't want to fertilize them too close to fall or they'll put on too much new growth and not be able to go into winter real well. But they do need a supplemental dose in July so that you'll have a nice new flush of bloom in August. I've added a few annuals along here. They're hard to see right now, but hopefully they'll be blooming in a few days, or a few weeks. I have Lychnus, which is uh, Maltese Cross. That's the red. And uh, Veronica, which is the purple. And those will continue to bloom all summer. Again, I will keep it deadheaded so that new blooms will form. Back on the trellis is another rose, and that is the rose William Baffin. And it is an old rose, and its origin is Canada, so it's quite hardy. Most of the Canadian roses are very hardy in this area and are quite trouble-free. Again, I will deadhead that one, and it will continue to bloom. Not as prolifically as it does in June, but 
nonetheless, we will get some blooms with it. I'm keeping my hummingbird feeder full and trying to change it every few days, especially when it's hot. The uh, sugar solution will ferment a bit and the hummingbirds don't like that. They also don't like a dirty hummingbird feeder. So if any uh, insects get in it, they won't use it. I did have a lovely little hummingbird there this morning, a tiny one, and uh, I hope he comes back. I've seen him here quite frequently. So I want to keep the feeder fresh for him. We can continue around the, the flower garden, but it's about the same thing. Things coming in and out of bloom and doing some deadheading. The peonies are finished. This is my last bloom. That was my last bloom on this particular one. So we did head that back. And I do kind of cut the bush back at this point uh, so that it doesn't get in the way. Again, more things. Tulips. I won't pull those until with just a slight tug like this, they come out of the ground. The ones in front were not ready yet. I hate having all these uh, old stalks and foliage around, but you really need it if you want blooms next year. If you really can't stand it, the other option is to dig those bulbs up and store them till fall and replant them. I opt to leave them in the garden and then just remove the foliage as it turns brown. Now let's head on over to the vegetable garden and see what's going on over there. Here in the vegetable garden, and the garlic is doing really well this year, but it's ready for a task to be done, and that is uh, removing the garlic scapes. You may have seen garlic scapes at the farmer's market. They are edible, and they need to be cut off the plants for the plants to make good cloves of garlic under the soil. So we'll go through and just cut them off, and then I'll take them inside. And we can cut them up for mild flavor, or you can saute them, you can grill them. You can use them in a number of ways. You can make pesto with them, a garlicky pesto, uh, probably adding some parsley or another herb to kind of cut the garlic flavor a little bit. But we'll just keep taking off these nice curly shoots Incidentally, they are also kind of cute in a flower arrangement. If they get really long, you can add them to a flower arrangement and have a funny little curly cute thing that everybody will wonder, what the heck is that? So there are lots of things you can do with the garlic scapes. This was arugula and uh, it has gone to seed. So it's time to pull that and we'll compost what's left. We've been pulling leaves off of it to consume, but this gets pulled. And then I will add a little compost to the area and replant it with something else. Uh, probably some lettuce here, and then where some of the lettuce goes, I'll put some more arugula in there. You'll notice the covers I have, and the covers are over my cabbage, primarily, and uh, kale. Something was eating it, and uh, this also protects against those little white cabbage butterflies. I saw one flying around here just a little while ago. And they lay their eggs, and then you have those nice little green worms in your uh, cabbage or your broccoli or your kale. And nobody really wants to have those that ruin your vegetarian meal uh, by adding a little meat you didn't want. So the covers do help keep the butterfly from getting in and laying their eggs. And what I've done is, uh, I just hold it down with rocks and try to keep it fairly tight on the, uh, on the ground so that the butterfly, again, being flying things, they don't tend to fly in. They don't tend to burrow underneath. I was having something else burrowing underneath, and this seems to have helped with that, too. I guess maybe it scares them away. I do have some uh, lettuce under here as well, but I opted to cover the whole row so that everything would be covered. And, and I'll get my rocks on it later. I use uh, clip clothespins to hold it to wires. And the wires I got at the hardware store, they are wires that are pre-cut for fluorescent lights, to hang fluorescent lights. And uh, they seem to work quite well to hold this. It would not be something you'd want to use in the winter 
or even uh, if you had really bad weather coming. But it works to just keep the insect barrier. This is a, a product called Reme, which is a fabric. It's our Agrabon is another name for it. And you can get it at uh, a farm supply or a catalog. It's very thin. It lets in the uh, light and it also lets in water. So it just keeps out the insects. And it works quite well as a mechanical barrier and keeps you from using a lot of pesticides, which I don't use. So it does help with those things. Now we're going to go over to the other part of the garden. Oh, you'll notice my friend has joined me in the garden. She'll be here. I don't know if she scares off any crows or not, but uh, she'll stay in the garden for the rest of the season. We can pose for a selfie. We've had a cool, generally a cool spring, April, May, and the peas have loved it, as has the spinach. And even the strawberries haven't done too badly, with, especially with the moisture we've had. I've been picking the peas, and I have three kinds, a little bit of each, and they've been delicious. These are the shell peas, and I've, you have to pick them every couple days or they overdo. And these get uh, opened, and you have your little peas inside. I'll open another one here. And so you throw away the shell and you eat the peas. Here's another one that has peas in both sides. And these are just about perfect. Nice little fresh peas. And there's nothing like a few fresh peas. They just don't compare to the frozen at all. Lightly cooked, they're delicious. The next ones I have are called snap peas. And these are picked off, they're a little higher a little taller, and the snap peas you consume pod and all. They have very tiny peas inside. You pick them when they're not real mature. If you wait till they're really mature, then you have peas and you can shell them out. But they're best when they're just partially filled out. And then we keep going carefully, and uh, the lesson here is don't get too close to the strawberries in the future when you plant. The last one is the snow peas. And these are the pipe peas you get in the Chinese restaurant with your Chinese food. And they're great in stir fry. And they can, uh, like all of the others, can be frozen. You do need to blanch them first. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But they're the large long peas, and these will bear for quite a while because I still see quite a few blossoms on them. Again, they like the cooler weather. If it gets really hot for an extended period of time, they will all stop blooming. The shell peas now are starting to turn uh, brown, and they'll be pulled first. Uh, eventually, all of these will be pulled, and we can plant some crops for fall in this area. The other thing I've been uh, harvesting, and harvesting regularly, are strawberries. And I've been fighting the chipmunks for these. And I've been picking them a little green and letting them uh, ripen up in the house at times. Once they get good and ripe, the chipmunks are right here. So it only takes about a day inside for them to be fully ripe. And again, I, you need to get out every day or two if you have strawberries. And so far per picking, I've gotten four to five quarts off of this small bed. They're really a nice crop to have. No pesticides used here, uh, so you don't have to worry about that and they're really nice. Again, the best time to harvest any of this is early in the morning before the sun gets out and things get too hot. Or later in the evening works too, if you can't get out in the morning. We have a few more nice berries up here. And I'll come out later this evening and finish picking this patch. I do use a green 
just dress netting from the fabric store over my berries. It seems to work the best to keep the birds out. The chipmunks is another story. They're very hard to keep out. They really like strawberries. Pulling it tight seems to help some. Uh, again, I put rocks on it. Perhaps if I put boards on it, it would be even more helpful because they tend to burrow underneath a little bit. But so far, we've shared somewhat and we've gotten quite a few strawberries. That brings us to another spring crop. And this year, the spinach has been absolutely wonderful. This is the spinach and it's going fast. You can see some of it has started to bloom already. It's got seed heads on it. If I were going to save the seeds of this spinach, I would let it form seed. I don't plan to do that, but I will replant spinach in the, for a fall crop. Sometimes I get a fall crop, sometimes I don't. It depends on how cool it is. The cool weather earlier in the season is what gave this spinach its great start. In front of the spinach are some Brussels sprouts, and in front of those are beans, and the beans are starting to blossom, so that means in probably two to three weeks, we will have beans to pick and eat. I'm still picking the green onions and letting the on spreading them out so that the onions will continue to grow and I can dig those in the fall. This area is summer squash and zucchini squash. And I've put more of the uh, landscape the not landscape fabric, the Rime fabric over them. Uh, this again keeps some of the insects away from it that will lay eggs and burrow into the stems and that's why you have the crops fail and uh, just wither up and die. So if we can keep those insects off of it, or at least a little bit, it will help prolong our harvest. Uh, I do have to take this off once they start blossoming because the pollinators need to get in to pollinate the squash. So I do lift it up about every day or so and if I start to see blossoms it will come off and be put away. These are called mechanical barriers and uh, they can be used, again, instead of insecticides, which I would prefer to do. Herbs are coming out, and cucumbers. My cucumbers did not germinate well. Whether it was the variety that I chose, whether it was the weather, I don't know. I've grown this type in the past with great success, but this one didn't work out so well. It happens. So I bought a few more seeds. This is a different variety. And uh, my package says 55 days. Well, there's... Uh, 30 days in July and 30 days in August. So it'll have plenty of time to give me some cucumbers. So I'll just add a few more seeds and see if they do a little better. And I'm just gonna poke them in every few inches. And see if I can get a few more vines to climb. In another couple weeks, I'll want to, when they start to uh, form vines, I want to put string on my teepee and that will uh, give them a place to climb up and then the cucumbers can hang down. It takes up a lot less space in the garden if you have things growing up. You can do that with pole beans as well. The tomatoes continue. I am using tomato fertilizer or uh, one of the fish oils on them about every two weeks. Same with the peppers and eggplants. They seem to need a little extra nutrition. Again, the herbs are coming and the flowers. So we'll have some flowers in about August that we can pick and perhaps share with a few other people. The parsley that I was last year's parsley is now going to seed. I'm going to let some of it go to seed and see if some will actually come up and be a crop for either this year, late, or next year. I did plant new parsley on the other side of the garden. I have blueberries, and this year they seem to have quite a few berries on them, and I will need to figure out a way to keep the birds from eating them if I wish to eat some. Uh, maybe I can hold this up and you can see 
the berries that are forming underneath. Here's some right in the middle of the plant. But they will need to be covered either with the fabric or netting to keep the birds out. This is a new crop for me. I've never grown tomatillos before. I made some tomatillo sauce, salsa last year with some that I purchased and we liked it. So I said, well, I'll buy a packet of seeds. $1.50 packet of seeds. And I started some inside and I have seven plants from that and they're now in blossom. So we, we may get some tomatillos. So we may have tomatillo salsa before the end of the season. I'm not sure how long it takes them to develop, but they seem to be doing pretty well in this location. So I'm happy to see them. Now let's go around and look at some of the other areas in the yard. Planters, if you've planted your planters already and they've started to grow, I, this one has been attacked by slugs. Slugs are slimy little snail relatives and uh, I do have the control that I've used on my hosta and I forgot all about planters. Slugs can climb, therefore they can get into your planters and uh, wreck some havoc along the way. This was a calla, canna lily, red canna lily, and it didn't look so hot. I thought I'd leave it to see if some new leaves form after I've added the uh, slug material. But I went to the garden center yesterday and picked up a couple of nice potted annuals. And you can add any time to a uh, container. In fact, if you add different things all season, you, you'll have something in bloom all the time. This will uh, go through fall. It's a salosa, and it likes warm weather, so it's getting it now. I also had a dahlia that I planted in here, and unfortunately, it didn't grow. So that leaves another hole. So that needed to be filled to have anything that looks like anything by fall. And this is a heliotrope. Uh, I couldn't resist it. It has a wonderful kind of baby powder scent. And it is an herb. Uh, not used. I'm not sure what it was used for, but it is a lovely plant. And I thought it would be appropriate here in this area. And hopefully these will form some new leaves and I can take off these old and tattered ones very soon. Now let's head back to where it's a little shadier. The canna in this planter that I planted has fared a little better and it doesn't have the holes. Uh, I did put in the slug treatment in this one as well. There are a few holes, but nothing serious. I've put in a lot of the cuttings that we took last fall and these are coleus and I'm going to keep pinching out that center portion of the leaves. on each variety. And this will uh, cause it to branch and become a full plant. This too needed a little extra. It does have a hosta that has been growing in here. This is a, a perennial and it comes back each year, which makes me think maybe I can put a few more perennials in here successfully. But most of these are the cuttings I took last fall. And so I got a begonia. Now I know if I put this on the ground, not only will it get trampled, they're very tender, but it too will be subject to slugs. And I can control that a little more here. So I'll be putting that in here to add a little more color to this planter, especially as it's seen from my patio. The plants along the edge are doing nicely. I have Japanese painted ferns and a stilby and hostas, small hostas. They uh, kind of fill in this little edge and a little dry stream runs along the back of this area. We'll head down towards the pond. Nice to be down in the shade on a hot day and I'm by my little pond, which is always a cool spot. And the fish are lively today. It's warm. And when it's warm, the fish are more hungry. Remember they are uh, in tune with their environment, you might say, and their metabolism varies with the temperature. So when it's warm, they are hungrier. They're moving around. They're very busy. So they're busy here eating, and I'll throw in a few pellets of food. Probably
probably about three times a day when it's this warm. It's, we're in the 80s now, and uh, they will enjoy having a little snack about three times a day, if I'm able. If I'm not, they will make it just fine. Uh, if I'm gone, they can last several days without too much food. But you don't want to leave them too long. They are, after all, kind of dependent on me since it's not a natural body of water. I finally gotten my planters set up back here and some of the plants have really taken a, a shot up and covered the area. These are all plants that are shade tolerant and you can do a lot with a shade garden. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, but my yard's all shade, I can't garden. Yes, you can. You just have to choose the right plants for the area. No, I won't have a lot of brilliant color in this area. I do have uh, some impatience and a few things like the astilbe. We'll put on a few blooms, but it's a quiet area. And that's okay too, uh, with the hostas and bernera. And this will be turtle head. This is a white turtle head. It'll have white flowers a little later. It's a little quieter, but it's still a nice garden. So yes, you can garden in the shade. I will continue with my slug and snail bait, which is, uh, this is the safer one with iron in it. It's not a deadly poison, therefore it's safe for Buddy to be out and around with it, or a cat. It's uh, pet safe. He doesn't eat those things anyway, but even if he did, it would be a safer alternative. Also the deer spray, and this is mostly a scent, uh, kind of a rotten eggs, garlicky scent and it does help keep the deer away. Deer love a lot of these plants. I started using it early, and by using it early in the season, the deer kind of get the idea that this is not the place to go. So I don't usually have too many problems with it, but I do keep spraying about once a month, just in case any of them wander in, or young ones have never been here before, wander into the area and decide, oh, this looks like paradise. No, it isn't. It's time to move on. I have fertilizer pellets that I'll be putting in the water plants. And each water plant gets one little pellet a month. Or if it's a large plant, two. And we'll just poke that right into the soil in the plant. And bury it in the plant. And that will keep the plant going. Uh, and producing leaves. Most of these are leafy plants. Uh, because this little pond is in the shade, I cannot grow water lilies or some of or lotus or some of the other plants that would require full sun. On the other hand, I don't have a problem with algae. So you have a choice there. And this seemed to be a good spot for a pond in our yard. So it is shady, but you are limited with the things that will grow. We have elephant ears, I have a ginger, an iris, uh, several elephant ears in various stages of growth. These can be brought in for the winter, which I do, and then brought out. Uh, they make it through the winter. I can't say they thrive, but if they make it, then they can come back out. Saves a little money because they are reasonably expensive plants to buy new every year. So I try to save as many as I can to put in it. But I can't grow the fancy ones. I've tried water lilies. And I might get one lily, but uh, it's not really worth it. Uh, water lilies are about $50 each, and for one bloom, that's a little dear for me. If I really wanted to grow water lilies, I'd start another pond in full sun. Then I could have the lilies. But I'd have to deal with algae and a few other problems as well. Now we've picked some things in the garden. Let's go inside and see what we can do with them. We're in the kitchen and uh, using some of the things from the garden today. Strawberries and snow peas are a couple of the things that are needed fresh. Really nice to have them, but when you have them, you need to use them. And uh, it's fun to have some recipes that you can count on for various things. Today I'm gonna make some strawberry muffins. I've made all kinds of muffins and strawberry ones sounded really good. So I'm gonna start with a quarter of a cup of butter and that's been softened and it's in my mixer bowl and I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of sugar and mix that well 
Then I'll add one egg. And mix again. And scrape that down a little bit. And continue to mix it until it's creamed together pretty well. And now we're going to add to a cup and a half of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, and a half teaspoon of salt. And I have a half a cup of milk. And I'm going to add alternately. And when the recipe says add alternately, that means you add a little of the flour, then a little of the milk, a little of the flour, and usually about two or three, depending on how much is there, additions of milk. But you always want to begin and end with flour. Particularly ending with flour is important. It just gives a better batter. So now I'll add about half the milk. And there's also a teaspoon of vanilla in the milk. I find if I don't add it to the milk, I usually forget it. More flour. rest of the milk. A little bit stuck here. Uh, to thoroughly make sure it's thoroughly mixed, I will scrape down the sides. You don't want to mix too much after you've added the flour. Any, uh, if you mix over mix it, you will have very tough muffins. There, our batter's all mixed. And I've already made a, a streusel mixture or crumb mixture using a quarter cup of brown sugar, a quarter cup of white sugar, a half cup of flour, and a quarter cup of cold butter that I've cut into this to make crumbs, mixing it well with a, a fork or the mixer to make some crumbs. These will go on top. I also have cut up a cup and a half of strawberries. I've uh, cut those in little pieces. Now I'm going to take my scoop and fill 18 paper muffin cups. And I've sprayed these muffin cups with Pam for an additional uh, ease in peeling them out. And they said to put two tablespoons in each cup. So that's what we're going to do. Scoop works very well for filling these. I have a larger one for larger muffins. This also works for cookies if you want large ones. There are different size scoops available. And We may not get all 18, or we might. And you can use the spatula to fill the scoop. And it looks like we will have 16, maybe 17. Right, we have one without, so we'll just remove that cup. And then I want to uh, put strawberries on each one. 
kind of spreading out the we'll divide these between them and I'll divide the crumb mixture on top and give it a good coating of that This type of topping is often used on a coffee cake. Sometimes it has nuts in it, sometimes it does not. This does not. These will go into a 350 oven for about 25 minutes. next thing I'm going to make is a salad with some of the spinach that we have been we used and I need to make a dressing for that and I'll do that in the blender and I have a quarter cup of olive oil and I'm going to use a quarter cup of uh, balsamic vinegar and this is a strawberry balsamic that someone gave me as a gift and I thought well this sounds like a good use for it the strawberry salad so add that to the blender too and then a little sweetener a half a tablespoon of honey and half a tablespoon of Dijon mustard. This adds a little zip. And we've got a little more of the vinegar in here to pour out. I'm going to blend this. going to pour this into a pitcher for serving with the salad. It makes a reasonably thick dressing. If you prefer, you can thin it down with a little additional oil. We can probably get a little more of that out later. But that'll be the dressing. And then to our uh, lettuce, our spinach, I'm sorry, the spinach has been double washed. And this is the spinach that we're uh, pulling as we, as we uh, use it because it's ready to go and we need to consume it rather quickly before it completely goes to seed. So I'm going to add about two cups of strawberries. About a quarter of a red onion. Cut very thinly into rings. And this is feta cheese, about an ounce and a half of whatever you would like. The proportions are not set in stone on this. And we'll add that. And then we have one more thing to add, and I'm going to cook together some butter. I'm going to put that on, in this little pan on the back burner. Push this out of the way a little bit. And this butter will melt very quickly here. I'm going to add about a half a tablespoon of this is about a tablespoon yeah, of brown sugar. We're going to mix that together with about a third of a cup of pecans. And 
and this will candy the pecans slightly. That should do it. Now we can take them off the heat and let them cool a little bit. Okay, these have cooled for just a brief amount of time. I'm going to sprinkle them over the salad. Try to spread them out a little so no one person gets all of them. They're really tasty. And then we'll drizzle a little dressing over it and our spinach salad is complete. And I'll just drizzle a little bit on for now and then people can add more later. So this is our salad. That's finished. And now we're going to make a stir fry with uh, chicken and snow peas. And I've, I'm heating some oil in the skillet. This is a stir fry pan. And I'm going to add some cut up chicken. This is one breast cut up, large one, actually. And I want to cook this until it's nice and browned, or at least starting to get browned before we add anything else. I have it at fairly high heat. It started to cook. It's uh, not completely done, certainly, but it started to uh, brown a little bit. And I'm going to add three cloves of minced garlic. And this is garlic that I harvested last year, and I uh, separated the cloves when they started to grow in my storage spot and put them in the freezer. And I took out three of them and chopped them up. They thaw quite quickly and it's a great way to store garlic once it's, uh, you can't keep it in oil, can't keep it in the refrigerator, but uh, if you freeze it and use it right from the freezer, it's safe. And we'll let the garlic cook a little bit. We'll start to catch the aroma. By the way, this is uh, honey garlic chicken with snow peas. And now I'm going to add some carrots and let them cook in with the chicken and garlic for a while. You could cook all the vegetables first and then add them back, but why dirty another pan? And we like our vegetables on the crisp side anyway. So we'll let this cook a little bit. If I had wanted to, I could have also added some onion at this time or maybe even some green pepper. But uh, I'm going to just keep it simple. A red pepper would be colorful. Now I'm going to mix a half cup of, uh, I'm sorry, a quarter cup of chicken broth, low sodium chicken broth, and a quarter cup of soy sauce. And to that I'm going to add three tablespoons of honey. I need my spatula for that. And we'll stir that in while these things are cooking. I'm going to add the mixture, the honey, the soy sauce, and the chicken broth. And we're going to let this simmer a little bit and make sure we get that honey dissolved. Maybe three minutes or so. I have two tablespoon or two teaspoons of cornstarch and I'm going to add a tablespoon of water. When you add, you can't just throw cornstarch into a mixture to thicken it uh, or you will end up with big lumps. You do need to add water to it 
equal or a little more than the amount of the cornstarch and make sure that it's dissolved. At this point I can add it in. And this will thicken up the sauce as we bring it to a boil and boil it for about a minute. And while it's boiling, I will add a couple cups of the snap peas. I've taken the ends off each one and sometimes they have a string that needs to be pulled. But we want to keep these pretty crisp, so we add them last. As this mixture boils down for about a minute, they will cook just fine and still be tender crisp. If you like them more done, you can put a lid on it and they will steam a little. They are so good fresh from the garden, you can practically, well you can, eat them raw. If you want to freeze the snow peas, one of the things you can do is uh, blanch them. And in order to blanch them, what I did is to put them with the water that they were washed in into a microwave safe container and I microwaved them for one minute and immediately put them into an ice water bath. This is called blanching and it stops the maturing process that vegetables automatically go through. It's what leads them to their final deterioration and it just keeps going if you don't stop it somehow and the heat of blanching will stop that growing process. At that point you can dry them and I use my salad strainer to dry the peas and then I put them into containers in the freezer so we can get them out this winter and have a nice stir fry. So this is our uh, honey and garlic stir fry. And we can put some of that over some rice. The rice, I cook uh, one cup of rice with uh, two cups of water. We have our nice juice to go with it. Put the rice back there. Oh, our salad with the uh, balsamic and honey dressing. And our strawberry muffins should be out of the oven very soon. And here are three that have been baked. And this is how they come out. And they make a nice dessert or even a breakfast. Uh, summer strawberry treats. And garden treats. Uh, garden meals. A nice way to cook in the summer from your garden instead of the supermarket. Thank you for joining me. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television.